Yes. As a reminder, don't forget to hit record. Um, this session, the data science session, is in a, um, it's an advanced session. 60 Mock has a long and very proud history of tackling topics that are a bit more, you know, a bit more difficult um, or a bit sort of those niche areas that people are curious about. But we, we make no apology to that they're actually advanced. You know, they're pretty tricky topics on it. We put on here, sometimes we swear, you know, it's for adults. Um, you know, it's uh, because we're independent, we can get away with that without anyone complaining to some, you know, corporate or in industry body going, hey, we're so crass. Don't worry, we're not going to swear hard or really, really hard on a Friday morning. Um, but some of the topics we've had have had people just, um, you know, maybe you know, soft swearing, but I will warn you, all right, but it is, and this is, and this is very much a, an advanced topic, and we hope you enjoy that too, I know you guys aren't, you know, people are smart, um, so we don't need to sort of go at an entry level stuff okay. here, and a lot of the people, when we looked at the attendee list, will bring assumed knowledge as well, so um, keep that in mind. Now, for those of you who've just joined, welcome, uh, great to have you here, and in the chat function, if you've got questions or statements or points that you're not sure of, given it is quite an advanced topic, feel free to like drop them into the chat uh, side of it. Um, I've got an alert up here and we'll make sure I try, do my best to answer this topic because this topic is, it's an abstract one and it's a pragmatic, practical one. So I anticipate you'll probably have a couple of different questions, you know, like from two different areas on it. and. It actually makes the session a bit more fun as well. All right. All right. We are now recording. Um, yes, my nickname is Moz, and um, I'm delighted to start with this question. All right. Because when you're on Zoom, it's very difficult to get feedback from people. It's, um, it's, we have to sort of reinvent the way we interact, and that includes you guys as participants as well. So my first question for all of you is, um, I'm going to throw a couple of horoscopes out there. Don't worry, it will make sense. Um, but the, um, just through a show of like thumbs up or something on there, like just to, you know, when you're looking at the, down there, that, I'm assuming most people are pretty good now with, um, with Zoom. But um, how, many, um, how many Leos have we got here? Any Leos? We've got one, only one Leo. Interesting. All right, how many Virgos? No Virgos, or no one admitting to be a Virgo, which is understandable because Virgos are a little difficult to get along with. Uh, Aries? Any Aries? Oh, God. Oh, Aries. I'm an Aries, yeah. And um, I don't know, Sagittarians, any Sagittarians out, out and about? Oh, right. oh, Sagittarians are like the best. Cancerians. My Cancerians. All right, I need someone to throw me in there. Oh, got a Cancerian there, great. All right, um, for those of you horoscopes I haven't mentioned, um, it's just an Aries thing. We just sometimes forget stuff, so, all right. But I want you to remember, what just went through your head as I started to label you or label us and how some things may have like even just popped into your head straight away. It's an interesting concept to follow through when we start to explore data science. All right, just hold that thought, hold that in the back of the thoughts. All right, now what is data science and what's driven you got all your cats to get up, probably go up into your home office. A lot of people work from home on Fridays. And, you know, what made you go, all right, I want to know more about data science. Um, actually, I'll also just get everyone to go on mute as well. I will just, if you're not on mute already, I will get you, I'll just quickly mute everyone just to, um, just to, whoop. all right, mute up people, great. So as I was saying, so what is data science and then why is it so topical at the moment? Now, data science, as the name suggests, is, um, it's not from the arts, the name sort of gives some of it away. It's from the field of real science. And if you did year 10 science, some of these concepts I'm going to show you will, you know, they'll be familiar to you. But in its essence, it's a multifaceted part of the of business now. 
uh, but data science is, as the slide says, it's a field of study. And it's this really sort of big field. And up until 2016, when it was sort of became popular, it was sort of just like a clump. They just said it's data science. But what it's doing is that it's combining domain knowledge, that is knowledge of businesses and organizational structures. So all of those things that you sort of learn around operations and all that stuff with programming skills. So they're being enacted, some of the changes or supported. So we're fusing IT together. But interestingly, the data science domain or the, the field inserts a knowledge of mathematics with a heavy focus on statistics to extract meaningful insight. And you will continue to hear the word meaningful throughout this, this presentation because I'm sure most of us have heard that saying, you know, there's lies, damn lies, and then there's statistics. It's very true in data science. But it's very um, important to comprehend that this is a scientific, this is a scientific part of how our businesses operate, which is useful to be aware of because it will clash with some of the more humanities-based fields that we see in business, like, you know, and I don't, I don't screw my nose up, but, you know, like the people stuff, the ambiguity stuff, you know, all of that stuff that is embraced over in those other fields is not embraced in this one. And there's a little bit of um, culture clash as we bring those two fields together under the umbrella of business. All right. So please keep this in mind. It is very scientific. <clears throat> and I, just as a quick reminder, because I thought it was sort of fun to do it as well, that so this concept around science is one to really sort of layer in. And I'll just put a little definition there. Science is this systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions about the universe. Oh, that's actually an official definition. So we just added and business as well. Uh, for those of you, I'm just gonna get everyone to mute away. Just mute when you come in. All right. But this idea of, um, that they, we look at a business in a very scientific sense. We have the, we put on our white coats and we decompose an organization and then we start to make, we start to make observations about the business before we make conclusions. I'll say that again, we make observations of the business before we make conclusions on it. And then data science is really interesting because what it says is we need to generate a hypothesis of what we anticipate will happen in a business or the strange, business environment, strange. test it in some form of sort of open curiosity and openness, and then implement change around it. So this is fundamentally, it's a different way to how many organizations are running now. And it's um, where, you know, where we use things more like gut instinct or, you know, we'll, um, you know, someone will come up with a strategy in a boardroom somewhere and then it will get, you know, sort of pushed back down across the enterprise. This is a more humbling approach when we look at how we use data and how we, um, and how we implement it. It says, no, 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 our business will, will tell us what it needs or our customers will or our social environment will tell us what we need. And we will make the observation, come up with an idea around it, test what our logic is, and then go forward on it. So it sort of changes the sequence of it. Now, the interesting part, um, I always find this stuff really interesting, that science can be traced back to ancient Egypt. There you go. There's something for your, um, your, next, quiz, <laughs> your next quiz session. But it is interesting how this idea of um, science and philosophy and Big, big picture and big concept thinking still is maintained within the field of data science right now. Now, data science is, if you want to get into this area, it's, um, it's the first time last year that it got tipped, it got pushed off the ranking as the most sought after skill or sought after um, sort of, you know, sort of a, a person that you want to hire into your organisation. Now, that's not to say that data scientists are becoming less interesting than these guys, the front end engineers. There's a lot of work going around globally on this. The, the um, and or Java developers or what have you. It's not, it is probably because as I said, the, uh, there's two things that have enabled the growth in data science. 
one is there, there is a massive demand. Like there's just demand everywhere. And like that big, what we see in lots of sectors, the big blob is now becoming more sophisticated and we're seeing different forms of data scientists emerging. And it's sort of coming through in, you know, in rapid succession, actually, we're seeing like the actuarists come through, we're seeing quants come through, we're seeing like people with very, very focused areas of knowledge within the field starting to join teams on it. So I think that big broad data scientist title is now going to start to a bit like business analysts. Remember, it used to just be business analysts. And now there's a whole different suite of business analysts underneath it. But the other part is this last comment on this slide is that the appetite to use data in strategy and business improvement and also just survival is because for the very first time, we have access to huge quantities of data, huge quantities whether it be for the, uh, the, the data that organisations are harvesting for themselves through their websites or what have you, but they're also able to then share data as well. Now that's great. It's great having this big pile of data laying around, but it doesn't really do much unless you can figure out ways to actually use data by using algorithms and scientific methods and to actually then use this as an insight, as a valid insight to evolve a business. That's what data science is, is technically, because, you know, technically uh, here to do. All right, I'm going to throw a few really heavy Friday morning concepts to start with. And one of them I will say, uh, I know one can be very close to Janet's heart, but data science, it's a study of data. All right, so pretty obvious in some ways. And we look at data as, uh, as a form of observation, but it's also an indicator of how our businesses or our organizations are running. We don't look at data for data's sake on it. We're looking at it as evidence of how the business is, and I think I'll just use the word business for the time being, is how it's actually performing within its ecosystem. So, and it's very powerful. It's incredibly powerful. Companies uh, now are using it uh, and organisations, government organisations are using it. We're seeing COVID at the moment. But what it's doing is, um, <laughs> I apologise for that dog barking. Um, of course, it's going to be a dog barking when I'm recording, of course. All right. Um, but the, the amount of data can be quite confusing. So one of the roles of a data scientist is to be able to discern around what is actually useful data and what is actually true data or what is actually giving just a false, like a false reading. Can you believe, I hope you guys aren't put off by that dog. I'm, there's a dog next door that's just carrying on like a pork chop and now my dog's barking. All right. Barely hear it. Good, thank you. Thank you for that confirmation. I'm like, oh my God. So the useful data, how do we actually create useful data within the field of data science? And it is using this model and this idea called ontology. Now, ontology is a phrase um, that you'll see more and more in business architecture. If you come to, I think in two 60 months time, we're actually gonna be talking specifically about ontology. Now ontology, apart from the fact it's a beautiful word and it just rolls off the tongue, what ontology is, is a really useful way to understand how do we look at this really weird abstract world of data how do we reset our mind to become more experiment based in the scientific sense, not in the entrepreneurial sense, and then being able to harvest or collect data that is useful for people to be able to make anticipatory, you know, anticipatory decisions or moves within their business. That's a big concept, right? That's actually like, how do we actually do it? And in the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you some examples of ontology that I'll, um, the guy who actually was, you know, apparent, I don't know how they actually do this, but what they reckon, the first dude who apparently is, they said, use this phrase or this concept was Pythagoras. And this is Pythagoras. This is obviously a photo of Pythagoras back. <laughs> he is, just for your um, Friday morning interest, he is an Ionian spiritual mathematician. That's one hell of a business card. And I suggest you Google him because that is like one of the weirdest like definitions um, I have ever heard of someone. I mean, don't worry, when we look at some of the history of that, so many people, it gets weirder and weirder. 
So one of, if you did year 10 math, you'll probably remember the Pythagoras theory. And, uh, and I normally hear if we were doing face to face, I'd ask the question, put you on the spot and go, do you remember what the, 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 the theorem is? So, well, I'm sure someone in the chat can do that. Um, please, someone do it in the chat if you want to have a. But one of the things with the, um, the theory of, um, of the Pythagorean theory is that one of the key aspects of it is that it decomposed or pulled apart known information and then allowed, then allowed the, um, the, the parts that were unknown to be known. And in essence, you could anticipate something by decomposing or knowing, you know, using what you already know type of thing with, with certainty to be able to make a prediction on what was going to happen next. But it was done in a very, um, this idea of ontology is also used in philosophy. So if you Google it and you become a bit interested in ontology, it also has a secondary meaning, which is the sense of, called like the sense of being. And so this is where we start to drift over into humanity, like the humanity subject. And it does drift over in data science into that this field as well. And the sense of being is sort of the advanced version of systems thinking. It actually says like, how does this thing exist? How does it live within the, the whole environment philosophically of it? So ontology can be is, is relevant in both of its definitions in the world of data science. How does this thing exist within the ecosystem, whatever this thing is on it? But what information do we have that when we decompose what is known about our organization, that we can then predict and analyze what the future you know, might be, what the present is, but we do that in a very scientific, uh, in a very scientific way, not in a gut instinct way. And thus, we use the scientific method heavily to be able to actually move forward and, and give some really, really good, you know, sort of recommendations and really solid ideas for our business. So the, here's a couple of fancy definitions on it. The ontology is a branch of, you know. It is actually worth having a look, by the way. It's sort of a really interesting. Um, Aristotle, all those old cats were into it. And what they were trying to do is make sense of existence. It sort of gets pretty heavy, pretty big, quickly. But the sense of being is, um, is a far more appropriate way of looking at your organisations than pure systems thinking. Systems thinking allows us to look within the boundaries of our organisation and maybe a little bit outside our ecosystems to be able to sort of understand how interactions, you know, are, you know, sort of in, you know, the cause and effect ideas are all happening and complex cause and effects. Whereas ontology takes it to another level and actually says, what is the whole purpose and the being of it? So for those of you in not-for-profits or in areas that are saturated in legal and risk structures, Systems thinking will get you so far. Ontology thinking will take you to a more 3D and a more holistic way of looking at how your business and parts of your business are operating. But they are quite heavy ideas. But this is how it all sort of comes together. Remember I said at the beginning, data science, you get a bit of programming like Pythagoras, you know, data extraction, we're indexing data, trying to make sense of it now because we've just got so much of it on it. But we use traditional mathematics to get statistics. We build algorithms based on our hypothesis of what we think could be going on. We test that and then we apply it within our domain knowledge. And the domain knowledge is where the ontology world kicks in. Oh, yeah. No, it's, it's good. Yep. Oh, well, thank you, Ashley. <laughs> oh, sorry. I don't realise I... I... Apologies. Oh no, I'm I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm taking the compliment. <laughs> I made this slide. So, <laughs> <All right. clears throat> so now the <clears throat> that's funny. All right, sorry. Um, so looking, at, yes, it is actually a lot of maths is based on philosophy. So now the difference for us over the last as many years is this huge surge of how IT is now transcending businesses. And, you know, I mean, the banking industry has been doing it for ages, but it's now going everywhere on it. So for the first time, we can use maths and algorithms with some, you know, some IT programming. We can break our domains down into this more ontological, on, 
I even practice this word, ontological sort of view of it. And we can rely or we can, we can be confident that our knowledge can be fueled with data now. It means often we need to index our data, harvest the data from the organisation, look for gaps in the data that we haven't got or insight, but then pop it into this field of study and then go, okay, we're actually getting a really solid view of what is really going on within our business on it. But it is, and this is a complex Friday, probably not great for Friday morning, but you'll see here, this is, this is actually a bit like a relational di diagrams, um, but it's also ontological as well. So in some ways, it, there is a bit of a crossover of existing knowledge, which will hopefully help you link how these things, despite them being advanced, but you'll be able to make some uh, connections to go, oh, yeah, yeah, I already know that. I already know how this thing works. Yeah, got that. But how does this other stuff layer over the top? And I've got a slide coming up, which I'm going to try to layer a few things um, together just to help the knowledge on it. All right. So how can data science and this, all these scientists, how can they be used? It basically, it's limitless now. And I think most people will have heard over the last few years that your organization's data is actually more valuable than gold. And I think there's been a, for many years during, you know, a lot of that charismatic leadership style and, you know, that type of stuff, we heard people talk about people are your biggest asset. That is true. People are a huge asset to organization. But one would argue that data is now becoming the biggest, uh, the biggest asset for organizations and well cared for data is probably going to be one of the big differentiators of the competitive advantage of it. Now, interestingly in healthcare, the one, the example I put in here is that data scientists, they're actually driving um, innovation. And the one I just put in here is this idea of a chat bot. So the chat bots are an enabler. They're a practical part of the data science field. But what a chat bot, you've probably been online, you know, sometimes they're frustrating if they're not learning, but they will collect information, the programming, the IT element, will collect information, understand the frequency of the questions that are, um, that are coming up from you know, stakeholders, and then start to build an internal knowledge network based on interactions with, in this story, or in this example, patients trying to find a doctor. You know, they like, we get the same questions over and over again. And some of the advanced chatbots are actually learning off the interaction and then evolving themselves of it. And this idea of evolving and being open to transaction queries and then just reacting to it is a very core principle of data science. There's not some analyst or general manager or someone just, you know, shooting from the hip saying, I reckon this is what we should do. This is actually real front line going, no, 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 this is actually the reality of what people are wanting because we can see it or sometimes in real time. And then we will adjust and make um, changes to our business based on real stuff. Now, this this is not an un, this is not an old concept, by the way, but it has been um, this idea of listening to a customer or listening to trends or whatever. It's been around for like a hundred years. But let's be honest, most people don't do it. They just rely on you know leaders to come up with the bright ideas of, of things. But the concept of being a chatbot is one that is probably as interesting as the way we label ourselves in horoscopes. And I will bring the two together somehow. Somehow, I'm going to try to bring this together. All right. But there are um, one of the advantages with data and this idea of how all these bits hang together is just the capacity to chunk through huge quantities of insight that a human cannot do on this level. All right. Just the, the sheer volume of data that can be looked at. So one of the examples is, you know, as these... Um, we have data scientists reshaping the way we use information networks within businesses. They can, you know, give proactive recommendations on patients who might benefit from a new clinical trial. You know, they can look at profiles match and what have you. These are all sort of characteristics or tasks that you see in, the, in data science. But it may also be in retail, you know, buying habits, you know, product knowledge. Finance is one I'm going to use as an example in a minute because there's a couple of controversial ones. But you can probably think of a million yourself. Like there's heaps of different areas where this idea where data is such a strong enabler on it. Staff promotion is a bit of a controversial one where 
um, do we promote people based on you know what the data says about them internally um, but there's a yeah there's a whole realm of, of different areas on it but it is becoming more pervasive across the whole business now <clears throat> unfortunately we're not allowed to have crystal balls over um you know even though i think pythagoras was into some of this weirdo stuff but anyway but how does like we've got all this data we've got these data scientists all mooching around examining the data trying to keep it clean you know trying to get everything set up so we can actually act on it how does data then how does it work and how do we move it from observation of the business to helping the business to anticipate what will happen to it this is that world of predictive uh, predictive analytics and then being able to use you know indicators to say all right we can move forward with confidence that this is definitely a part the, the the data scientists can help businesses become more anticipatory which is competitive advantage but it can also help with you know like just helping to avoid risk as well the answer to them becoming more anticipatory and being able to poise themselves to be more responsive to changing environments is that they understand the idea of constant experimentation. Now, I have heard this word experimentation used in the agile um, area, and there's no, um, no, no criticism of agile at all, at all. There's nothing like wrong with it when it's executed properly on it. But experimentation in the science field is very different to experimentation than the entrepreneurial field. The science field are naturally skeptical. They will look for evidence-based uh, information before making a move, and they will test things through different, through different areas before they come to a conclusion. That's a really big concept, right? And you can imagine now, imagine going to your boss and then saying, we're gonna do constant experimentation. If they have a filter or bias in their head that experimentation means entrepreneurial, you just get that pushback, like, I'm not gonna do that. Yeah, that's just a waste of money. However, if it is set up and you have an organization that is developing a knowledge of this and then says, no, 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 <clears throat> this is low risk. We're gonna take the lowest risk. We're gonna use evidence and we're gonna use data. And then we will experiment based on our hypothesis to see whether what we're concluding is correct before we make a move on it. Now in, in science and in the field of research, it obviously you get, there's obviously a lot more time um, in businesses, time is money. And a lot of those, architectures and the structures that are emerging in successful businesses is allowing really fast experimentation on it and you, you hear like what if scenarios real time almost real time modeling and real time adjusting to how businesses are, are having to you know react to their bigger environment so it's sort of like that chatbot concept on steroids on it in banking it's used in risk and insurance and a whole variety of different areas where they're using this sort of this information, they've set the structures up so it can be used um, in such a way that they can just you know, act almost in real time. It's, it's a really interesting idea on it, how fast this stuff is moving now. But at its core, it says that you use observation, we're highly skeptical, and we're also very self-aware that scientists and data scientists and business analysts and leaders, we are all <clears throat> almost permanently impaired with our own bias. So one of the things I've put in this, in this little, little prezzo is the huge and scary thing uh, that is going on with bias with data. And I'm gonna show you an example which might alarm you that's going on right now around, um, yeah, with bias. But I wanted to take a moment on this because we are, we're all flawed. We have, apparently we have about 200 different bias network, bias, so frameworks in our head. We have opinions on age, we have opinions on gender, we have an opinions on nationality on it, which is deep within our psyche on it. And unless we're using a more skeptical, clean scientific method, and we try as best we can to abandon those biases, we can build data science models um, that are actually quite unethical at one extreme level, but probably in a less, you know, less, um, you know, less scary front are just flawed. They're just flawed. So it's like having a dashboard in your car that's telling you the petrol is about to run out, but you're actually giving it the wrong data. So it doesn't, 
you know, like it, that, that, that's probably the, the least case scenario of severe impact. The worst case is actually having quite embedded and scary, scary bias, which I'll show you an example in a minute, which is a real life one at the moment. All right, here's the scientific method. If you want to like study that, the main thing is saying don't like look for what is real, not what is just obvious to you. Because our confirming bias, that is the bias where we look for evidence, we actually seek it out that actually supports our own opinion on something, on it is what is obvious. Scientists don't do that. They don't, I mean, they probably do. Perhaps, I know there's a few scientists on the, on the line right now and they'll be going, no, 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 we do that too. But for us who are just babes in the wood of integrating this way of thinking into the business environment, um, we're learning, we're like at 101 here. And having to abandon the idea of what is obvious um, is, is quite, it's actually quite challenging when you've got it, when you're up against it with time and you're just trying to get a result and you might not have architectures and structures that are liberated enough for you to be able to, you know, to be able to act like this. You just, you know, you just go to the route, you know, the easiest route on it. But beware, you're probably not then acting in the field of data science. All right. And Jack, Mike, sorry, Gavin's just been here. Jack, the Microsoft chatbot that learned, yeah, it turned bad. That was funny, was it? it was in less than 24 hours it became a, um, for those of you who watched, that was a couple of years ago. They put it on, it was listening to Twitter and social media and then it learned and then became some crazy right-wing Nazi that hated everyone and started, which was interesting when it was learning off the social media. But yeah, that's a perfect example of, um, they were, it, was, it was just an example, but it was a funny one actually, I gotta say. All right, now I'm going to try to fuse together this really complex diagram here, which I think most of you who are in this field will be familiar with these types of things. But I'm going to try to then layer in this broader idea of ontology and the idea of being. Because when we're, I mean, I've been working in this sector for a couple of decades now, and it's quite often you'll see people struggle when they'll, they'll ask, you, you'll get some big concept thinking, and they'll go, but how does social capital impact what we're doing here. How do we integrate that? And the answer is typically it's too hard just stick to our knitting. We'll just stick to the boundaries of our organizations. But data scientists now might be the new, you know, the rooks on the, uh, the chessboard that say, we can actually look at some of these different trends and we can look at some of this data that's available either within our own organization or the shared environment and then see what we can do to change the state of being of how our business is operating. And I've just got a couple of examples here. So social change at the moment. So imagine these, like we've got these elements or these sort of decomposed structures within your, your organization. So I don't, know, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Acme, Google this company, Acme. They've got a, uh, they got a mission up here. The, the senior leaders have put together, you know, their mission statement, their strategy, and what they're gonna do on stuff which is fabulous, but how do we then, as we're executing against this, this sort of strategy, how do we bring changing social sentiment into the evolution of this, you know, of this, um, of this strategy in, in really fast succession, not every two years or three years when they update strategy plan on it. And what the answer is, is, the, is how data, we actually understand how data is feeding our awareness of how this enactment of the strategy is being received by the ecosystem. Now, this is a point that's quite a heavy statement. So I might just, just, just give me a thumbs up if you're still with me on some of this stuff, just so I know that everyone's not going, what the heck? This is too heavy for Friday morning. If you're sort of following me, just roughly give me a thumbs up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It's okay, a few people have gone like, yeah, no, nah, we're lost. <laughs> cool. <laughs> oh, look, I love us. But this idea of the ecosystem is quite, um, is really, really, really sort of getting bigger and bigger. Legal environments are becoming more pervasive and more, um, we're seeing that it's really interesting legal arguments starting over in Sydney where I think it's SPC are saying they won't let workers return to work because of COVID unless you're vaccinated. We won't be able to do certain things. This is like a really different sort of 
you know, intrusion into what used to be our own little world where we would just do whatever we liked within our business. In fact, that's how the businesses have been set up legally across the world, that you're, in, you know, you're in charge of everything. But we're now seeing that that's not, that it's not like that. It's slicing through more and more. Now, I added climate change just as a bit of a wild card because it's, um, it's interesting that this state of being, this collectivism that we're seeing globally on some of these big issues is now having to shape how we as smaller components of, you know, as participants in the, the globe and all that stuff, how we're actually having to all comply. In the past, we would then be coming up with strategies, live in our own little world, you know, we'd be like hanging out, doing our best to interpret it. And then we would sort of, you know, sort of flick it backwards and forwards that there would be this sovereign border between these really complex environments here. And then, you know, and then we just have climate, you know, we'd be thinking, oh, I don't know, do we do much here? It's green, we got a green policy, that's good enough. But increasingly, that's not good enough anymore. So uh, when we're looking at how the businesses are running, we can make a prediction saying, look, actually, are we, um, are we actually contributing to this? And it's, uh, the data can tell us in a, it far, far quicker than the old cycle, the old systems uh, way of thinking. All right, this is a bit of an example. You'll see like the social, some of the social changes that we're seeing globally over the last couple of years will start to change the way businesses, like the external environment and the and how it, how it operates in its state of being will start to, you know, be starting to mess us around um, or disrupt us internally on it. And legal is just everywhere. Now, these little pillars I've put here, there's three, mainly for cosmetic reasons, but there's a whole lot now that are coming up on, on, in different areas with different levels of complexity and demand as well. Um, now, that's probably, that may have blown some of your mind. If you're not too familiar with the field of science, you know, data is being used in, in this area, you might be sitting out and going, oh my God, this is so hard. I, do, I don't want to scare you off. It is. In it's, it's actually quite a basic building block style of, um, of examining a business. We decompose businesses, we pull it apart. And then, as I said at the beginning, like there's, there's, two, there's two definitions of the word ontology that are both appropriate, uh, but, and it's both very relevant in the data sense, in the data science world. But if you get a bit overwhelmed by this whole idea of how the heck do we re-engineer the business to contribute to the reduction in climate change, take a deep breath, have a cup of tea and just go like, and go back to first principles. First principles tell us that the business or your organisation can be decomposed in some way. So we break it right down. We break it right down to our data elements on it. We look at the relationships of it. And then we categorise it in such a way that we can look at it and then go, okay, so that chunk goes here, that chunk goes there, and we start to make sense of it, just like Pythagoras did and all those other guys. So you can probably wear a toga if it makes you feel more creative when you're trying to do a decomposing and wear, and have that little weird ball with, I don't know, the symbols on it, whatever it is. Um, but the only difference, I guess, from some of the more traditional training for those of you who are in the analyst world is that we don't listen entirely to the story of leadership and strategy, we actually listen to the voice of data. What is data telling us? And what is, um, when we're observing this, um, when we're observing and creating this idea of a hypothesis, what are we actually looking for? And how do we enact that within the business analyst and the business creation uh, side of, you know, side of what we do on it? And then we look using traceability to find the data that supports that. And then we test it to go to say, look, is this true? Are we getting a, like a real reading or not? Is what we thought happening true or false? Or do we not have enough data to make a decision as yet? Now, I'll just do a quick one. I felt like that was a bit, I sort of jumped around a bit. Is that just through a show of thumbs or I don't know, little emojis? Like you guys like, yeah, you still with me a bit? Yeah. Even when I said it's, um, yeah, good. I've got a couple of people. Nani's like, yeah, no. Rachel and Deb, you know, they're like, oh, this is, oh, little mouse. I like little mouse. Well, a few people haven't, just, do you guys know how to use the thumbs up? Or you actually, have I lost a few of you? Like, maybe I'll do it the other way. 
if um if you're not sure of that stuff, maybe give me a like a non hand emoji if you like. No, say that again. I don't quite get it. <laughs> or if you're now watching YouTube, that's okay too. I'm not offended. <laughs> oh, good, good. All right. Okay. Well, I'm going to make the assumption. I'm going to that most of you sort of roughly are sort of you know sort of following us here on. Um, it, these are really big concepts. I will I will say so. You know, big one, and then we've got to decompose it and bring it right back down into our little into our little areas. So I wanted to add because it's so topical in data science, and I think it's a good warning for you um, to all be aware of are areas to be concerned around with data. We all know the phrase "what gets measured gets done." We all know it. It's like yeah, and a lot of the training in Lean and Six Sigma. Uh, ask us to rapidly come to a conclusion and then almost re-engineer our knowledge to be able to support this idea that this is how we can improve a process or what have you. But data science has this way of freezing an organisation because it, you know, it sort of collects the data and it becomes incredibly confident, just like the dashboard of your car. And it says, that is true, that is true, that is true. And you'll see behaviours and, and things happen as a result of it. At the moment, there is a very, very large discussion going on around how data science is not being used appropriately in certain areas. So data science, as I've sort of said many times now, is that it relies on this idea of a hypothesis. It also asks of us to be skeptical of our own knowledge and to test our own bias all the time and constantly going, you know, are we on the right track here? We're also, asked as scientists to be flexible wherever possible if the evidence or the information that's flowing back is not what we thought or it's starting to prove that the hypothesis is not correct on it. Now those they're very it's rationalist thinking it's um it's the longer way of thinking on, on in some areas on it but it is largely without ego and it, you can probably think about some of the people you work with if we were to say your gut instinct and your talent as a designer and all of that stuff, we're actually, we're not going to rely, we're not going to use that now, or it's going to de be deprioritized in favor of good quality data on it. And that goes from sales strategies right through to, you know, like anything really. We're actually going to deprioritize the old gut instinct. It will also, uh, data, data science, um, when you start to see it implemented, also will highlight and rub up against poor delivery of poor change execution, poor change and just poor execution in general. Because as I think many of us know, when you see really poor execution of an idea, it erodes over time. The original intent erodes through, you know, change requests, you know, bad stakeholders, bad scope, bad talent, just bad skills over and that original integrity that exists on the, on the original idea that in some ways we have to be stubborn on while still serving flexible and the evidence comes back, um, <clears throat> we become less tolerant of poor execution when we start to drift away from the original idea. And data science is, um, it's interesting when you see it come up, when you see some of the evidence come up that actually opposes the belief structures, particularly leaders or people who've had really strong concepts of things. And this is the, this soft area that you need to be so aware of on it. Um, I have seen it probably in the last couple of years almost paralyze some people because data doesn't lie on it. And if it's well constructed and it is incredibly rational, it is genuinely frighteningly transparent. And when we get, and we know when we frighten people, um, <clears throat> And people start to get scared by what they're seeing, they will typically, they can typically reject it. Uh, it's too much, it can be overwhelming, particularly if we start to trigger off, you know, bias problems. And they would they will just reject it and then they'll go around it on it. And I do, I really encourage you to, to really sort of think about it. I, I've done some work uh, over the last year or so where some of the evidence was so shocking that. Everyone was like, don't tell the leaders that. Don't tell the leaders that. 
it'll freak them out too much and they'll be in a bad mood. Almost like you're trying to hide something from mum and dad on it. But I probably can't actually sort of, I don't know, understate that. The data will tell you whether your business is going well or not on it, but it has this real soft side to it. Now, the other part is that to be aware of when you're putting together um, your little principles and, you, you know, how you're trying to put it, bring in a data science, um, maybe a capability within your business, or you're trying to bring these skills in, is that the skill of harvesting the data, indexing the data, tracing it back to where you know, it came from are all good practical skills. You can go learn those. Managers can start enforcing them as, as a real core requirement. But <clears throat> interpretation is like poor interpretation of a data uh, can lead to inadvertent abuse of data or, or, it can't, or it's not being used properly. Now remember that, that funny, that sort of really weird picture I showed you before of like external like social changes. All right. I'm going to share with you a story, just a little case study here, which is a really neat example of where data for the last 20 to 30 years has been impacting social environments and it's been hidden on things. Um, but it, you can see the complexity of how data scientists need to put together hypothesis that looks at, like in this one, I'm going to show you social equity, but how a bias can be embedded into a data science algorithm, then stuck into some programming, and it can be quite dangerous. So we've got this thing called confirmation right, bias. You know, we look for we look for things to let us know, yep, yeah, that's all good on it, which feels a bit wobbly, it feels a bit personal, which is true. But there's also more rigorous confirmation bias. So this one here, credit scoring systems or similar things are happening over in health insurance as well. There is a hypothesis that's been around and it came from observation in the banking system that said people in what we call poor postcodes, sorry, the inverted commas aren't quite right, but say people who are um, in areas that we know have lower social, you know, just have less jobs. There's just, there's just not as much money up there on it. So that's an observation that has started from banking, you know, ages ago. Also within that same list of criteria are women. Um, so all the women will start like, well, if you're a feminist, you know, just in general, this will freak you out, but this is true on it. Banks will look at women and then say, because of a traditional observation or a bias that they think that they're not going to make as much money. Well, technically we don't, but um, that they will score applicants on home loans and personal loans more harshly because the evidence has been collected over the years is that people in this story here is that poorer postcodes are more likely data-driven to default on home and personal loans. So the data continues to rot, like jump over itself and says, yeah, if you get someone from a postcode, I don't know, I'm not gonna point out any postcodes because I think it's pointless at the moment, because I'll, I'll be, I'll just be a part of the bias network, is what it says is people from those areas are lower, and this is a true story, the data is saying true, they're actually less able and are more likely to default than those people in wealthier postcodes or more social postcodes. And so what the data suggests to the decision makers is create higher levels of barriers and obstructions <clears throat> so we don't get those people in because our goal is to make sure the organisations are you know, well serviced from, from, a, um, you know, from a risk and you know, collections and all that, that side of thing on it. Now, this is a really, really sharp example that is one that transcends the enterprise and it jumps over to social. Um, and it says, well, <clears throat> yeah, correlation versus causality, yeah, exactly. But it has this social element that, that data scientists need to be aware of. Like, what are you actually, what is the broader sense of being of your organization. Now this one, the credit scoring system is one that is, it's a deeply hidden secret in banking. Um, they don't give it away. It's all shrouded in non-disclosures and what have you. 
um, and you're not supposed, no one's supposed to know. It's like, and you will have seen, if you've worked in banking, there's like a red, amber, green. They say this person's good, bad, and different. Uh, credit scores are built up over some of these, uh, these elements as well. But certainly the banks are custodians of it. The long-term consequence of making it harder for poorer people is a social issue on it. And that's something that is quite difficult, but it needs thought around it because this is a social equity thing. This same idea is also true in health insurance as well. So if you have a pre-existing condition, the data will tell you that, well, that person's probably more likely. Yeah, 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 Lisa. Yeah, yes, exactly. It's been, the issue's been raised in yeah, health research a lot, yeah. The, and now health insurance at the moment, <clears throat> and probably last, probably last five to 10 years probably, are saying people with pre-existing illnesses are more likely to claim more off their um, off their health insurance, which is logical and you know commercially commercially sensible. But when we abstract ourselves with the sense of being and we pull back and look at it and go, actually, people who are sick probably shouldn't get penalised for being sick, like financially, despite the data telling decision makers that is exactly how like. Um, yeah, how that is exactly how we should be doing this, you know, like to, because it, commercially it makes total sense. On to, on like the social ontology, it doesn't make sense. On it, in fact, it has a sense of um, dispersion that appears in data and decision making that is quite disturbing on it. And this is why I put it in here because you need to be looking at these and looking at the bias, but also the consequence of the hypothesis and the modeling and the algorithms that are going into organizations on it, because there is no other sector in any of the world that has a bigger influence on social other than business. You know, like sport does some, politics does some, you know, spirituality, religion does some, but business, we are all united in being involved in, in some way of it. And there is, there are, you know, you can get online, there's a lot of people getting a bit like crazy about this saying we can't continue to have poorly formed algorithms that are generating big social issues. And right in the centre of that are data scientists who uh, will and are held accountable for the observation and then looking at recommendations on how we actually help businesses to move forward. Now, why don't I sort of just finish up on a couple of these things? All right, hypothesis thinking. There's a couple of things as scientists. Um, that is scientists are really cool culture of curiosity and a willingness to learn like a bot right you got to learn like a bot take the information run with it you've got to get rid of ego out of everything and as soon as you start to see ego or the I call it the I reckon moment which I mean I have no evidence or data behind me but I reckon this will be the right thing to do is these are all red flags that the capability of data science will just will start to get compromised and the same is true for the unity and execution. If unity and execution starts to get flawed or you have poor project management and poor change management, a lot of the good work that you might be doing over in the data science practice will get sort of compromised because it's sort of like, you know, I don't know, just gets eroded along the, on the path. Now, my friends, it is now dead on nine o'clock. I have rushed you through this amazing new field of data science. It is probably at the forefront of lots of people's minds at the moment, but it is not without some concern. There are some um, social concerns. You need, it is a complex area, um, but a really, really interesting one. And you can see why Pythagoras and all those guys who are probably right at the forefront, just, you know, hung around in togas all the time, like just thinking about this stuff, going, this is so interesting. But luckily for them, they didn't have chat box like the one over at Telstra, that is really annoying on it. Um, so I hope today you were able to um, understand a little bit about this amazing new field, the different areas of programming, maths, the fact that it is born out of the world of science, not humanities. It is disciplined and it has this level of, um, this level of integrity to it that is more like the science world than it is the humanities or even the business studies world on it. Uh, this I'm going to open up for questions. If anyone's got a question or a comment or what have you. Um, I know a lot of you got to go at nine, so it's 9.01. I know we stuck to time. I sort of started a minute or two later. But I will let you know, this will uh, recording will go up on our YouTube channel. And 
I will sound like one of those YouTubers now. We do encourage you to subscribe. There are a whole lot of things on there. There's like free things, there's like 60 mock things, there's interviews. There's even Janet Bannister's podcast up there where she talks about business architecture. And uh, we do release new content probably every couple of weeks. So any questions, thoughts, feedback before you all race off? And you can put it in chat and I can read it out as well. Love your work, Marina. What was that? I said, I love your, sorry, I love your work, Marina. Thank you very much for this. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, you're very welcome. It was a really interesting topic, this one. It's, I mean, they're all interesting, but it's, um, yeah, it's, this one's really, it transcends so many different areas and you can see how, you know, the business of, the business of business is going to get knocked around a bit, hopefully. Hopefully, hopefully the most credit scoring uh, bots will get examined as well. I don't think they actually got that examined in the Royal Banking Commission either because I kept an eye out every morning. <laughs> Any others? Well, in that case, I am going to bid you adieu. Um, you can follow, yeah, if you've got any interest or in learning more about this, um, come along to Business Architecture coming up, which we're going to dive into how you actually get your ontology sorted. And uh, there's a whole lot of stuff that you can join us um, yeah, uh, between now and the end of the calendar year. All right. Have a wonderful Friday, everyone. Get your white lab coats out. Be sceptical. Don't listen to the ego-driven crazies that try to tell you how to run the place when you've got data that says, nay, nay, this is not correct. Make sure your integrity is like 100% spot on. All right, that's it for me. Have a great day, everyone, and look after yourselves. See ya. Bye.